So now it's my pleasure to introduce Jessica Kingdon. She's a New York-based Chinese-American director and producer who is named one of the 25 new faces of independent film by Filmmaker Magazine and was selected for the 2020 Documentary New York 40 Under 40 list. Her award-winning short, Commodity City from 2017, was shortlisted for a Cinema Eye honor, and it played at over 50 film festivals, including at Rotterdam, True False, and Sheffield. She co-directed the short, It's Coming, from 2020, and Routine Island from 2019. Jessica's producer credits include Tanya Cipriano's Born to Be, from 2019, Ian Bell's 808, How We Respond, from 2019 as well, Nathan Truesdell's The Water Slide, from 2018, and Johnny Ma's Old Stone, from 2016. Jessica is a member of the Brooklyn Filmmakers Collective. Also a uh, part of the panel is Kira Simon Kennedy, who is co-founder and director of China Residencies, a multifaceted arts nonprofit that was, has supported over 70 international ex creative exchanges to China since its inception in 2013. She's been a fellow of New Incorporated, the New Museum's incubator for art, to connect creative creative people with opportunities worldwide. Kira's first feature film as a producer was on Annie Simon Kennedy's 2013 debut, Days of Grey. She's produced over 50 short documentaries about China's underground music scene for the Beijing-based record label Modern Sky. And she's producing a documentary series for the British Council on the creative scenes in China's second and third tier cities. Kira has produced Jessica Kingdon's award-winning short documentary, Commodity City, and splits her time between China and the United States. And uh, our panel will be moderated this evening by Stephen May, who is an Emmy Award-winning filmmaker based in New York City. His 2018 film, Crime and Punishment, received a special jury award at the 2018 Sundance Film Festival, a 2019 Emmy Award for Outstanding Social Issues Film, and was shortlisted for the Oscar for Best Documentary. Stephen's previous documentary, High Tech, Low Life, was broadcast nationally on the award-winning series POV and his short film, The Surrender, which was produced with Academy Award winner Linda Portrois, received a 2016 World Press Photo Award for Best Documentary and was nominated for a 2016 Emmy Award for Outstanding Short Documentary. Stevens made numerous short films, published on Time Magazine, PBS, The Nation, New York Times, The Intercept, and Field of Vision. He's a Sundance Institute Fellow and recipient of the International Documentary Association's inaugural Enterprise Investigative Journalist Grant, as well as a John J. Henry Frank Guggenheim reporting fellow, and he's the recipient of the IDA's prestigious Courage Under Fire Award. Stephen's a member of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Science. So please join me in welcoming our special guest this evening to the stage. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, this is such a thrill and an honor to be here um, to talk about Jessica and Kira's film. Um, I, I had the special privilege to chat with Jessica on and off during this, the final year of her post-production. And from my very first viewing, I, I found it to be one of the most unforgettable and special films that I hadn't seen in a long while. Um, it, you know, as you just experienced, it's emotional, it's alarming, it's beautifully arranged and incisively photographed. And um, I think it's one of these really special kinds of films that um, challenge us to reframe these kinds of ideas we think we're familiar with, 
but realized that actually in the end that we have been largely complacent to and um, thereby disrupts that complacency. And I think that that's a really rare kind of film um, to take such formal risks to arrive there. So there's so much to talk about. Um, and I wanted to just um, dive in and situate, or situate ourselves a little bit um, by asking your, you guys to introduce yourselves and, and share maybe what one of your most memorable moments from this entire crazy journey has been. Um, well, firstly, thank you, Steve, so much for, for doing this. It, we had a very special relationship with this film since he was a mentor on it and saw early versions. And um, I feel like having his eyes on the film early on and just hearing his thoughts about it really has been a gift since your eloquence and talking about things and how you frame them is just so insightful for me. Um, so It's very generous. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's totally true. Um, so I'm just really glad and honored to have you here. Um, in terms of most memorable, there are so many um, different memorable moments to have, but I guess I would say one thing is just um, a lot of people are always asking about access, how we got access to shooting in all of these places. And I myself, while shooting it, was even surprised that um, all of these locations so generously let us in. But some of the more memorable um, experiences was just having the whole idea flipped of the whole um, cultural scripts around who is in power flipped when asking for permission to film in a space. Um, one example being when we asked, I think it was a plastic water bottle factory, um, if we could film there, the, um, the manager was reluctant and skeptical because he was worried that after, after the film was done, we would hit him up with a bill, meaning we would charge him an appearance fee to be in our movie. And so that certainly was not expected. And so our co-producer, Maggie Lee, who was a, um, she helped gain access to a lot of locations. She had to convince him and kind of assuage his fear that we were gonna charge him afterwards to appear in our movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, there's so many memorable moments. Thank you so much. Thank you. As we talk about water bottle factors, <laughs> um, that um, well, one that really sticks with me are actually some of the moments that might not be really apparent what they are in the film. Um, but one of the places that we had a very hard time finding a place to film in was a cryptocurrency mine, um, and we were really interested. Um, so much of this film is about work and about new jobs that didn't exist even a couple years ago. Um, but the cryptocurrency mining industry is a very gray area that's since been totally outlawed uh, in mainland China. And we were looking for these places, and when we got, found one, kind of by combining like other people's great journalistic research and like satellite imagery, uh, we got there and we were talking to the folks who were guarding the mine, and we were like, "Can we come film the cryptocurrency mining?" And they were like, "Oh, what's that?" And we were like, this place. And they were like, oh, the computers. You want to film the computers? Why do you want to film the computers? <laughs> and we were like, oh, you know, they're making digital money, and it's very important. We're making a film about the economy in China. And they were just like, oh, yeah, sure, go film the computers. And then as we're filming, and Jessica's in there with the camera, and I'm talking to the guards, and they're like, why do you care about this? You know, we're like, oh, the shapes are really important. We're just saying, like, oh, are you, are you film students? We're like, no, no, we're just filmmakers. Um, then at some point, someone must have WeChatted the boss, who then they were like, no, no, actually, you can't film here. They don't want you filming here. Please leave. And we were like, no, really? It's like, OK. Well, so we ended up leaving. Um, but finding some of the most beautiful shots that end up at the end of the film accidentally, because the cryptocurrency mine is powered by a hydroelectric dam. And so just by walking along where this was after we couldn't keep filming, we ended up um, just by this river where the retirees are going for their evening swim and the little girls are playing in the marsh. And those moments that are the only moments in the film where people aren't working um, happen really serendipitously because of this cryptocurrency mine. Hmm. Yeah, there's so much beautiful happenstance. And it seems like the vision for the film is such um, kind of an, an alive um, and evolving spirit. And I'm curious, you know, it's like in filmmaking, we all approach this idea of like getting access with trepidation and also um, 
kind of ethical responsibility. And I'm, like, how would you present the idea of this very, you know, ambitious and highly experimentally structured film? Like, how would you explain it to yeah. these factory owners? And yeah, we tried to be as um, transparent as possible. And luckily, because we weren't making a straightforwardly political film, um, we were able to explain that we were independent American filmmakers making a film about China's economic rise and wanting to show what this translated to for people on a day-to-day -day basis. And that would mean spending time in these places, um, shooting a little bit differently in terms of having, like, when we would go into a space, we weren't looking for a specific shot or a specific moment. It was kind of seeing how, um, how things would unfold, really. But a lot of times, people didn't really understand what to make of us. And um, one great example when that illustrated this was when we were in a, the carpet factory that you see. Those carpets end up at Ikea, by the way, a lot of them. Um, we, the boss called us in for tea the, on the second day that we were there, which meant that we were in trouble. And he was angrily talking to our fixer in this very serious tone. And we didn't um, know exactly what he was saying at the time. And it turned out he thought that Nate, the co-cinematographer, and I were corporate spies from America coming to steal their factory secrets. Mm -hmm. And our fixer, Jack, had to say, look at these idiot Americans. Do you think they're capable of stealing your, <laughs> your technology <laughs> secrets? Um, so, and he made me um, show the boss some art school videos I had made in grad school to prove that we really were who we said we were. Kind of thing. Um, and, and he was so skeptical. He was like, if you guys are really um, documentary filmmakers, then where's your host? Meaning, where's the person in front of the camera talking in a microphone and explaining what we're seeing? Because a few months ago, they had had a Japanese film crew come and film that um, factory as well. And so they were used to like a different type of filmmaking style. So a lot of it was really, they, a lot of, not a lot, but several of these places were used to news crews coming in and filming, and, but it was a different type of, a different style of filming. So yeah, sometimes it was hard to put that into words. And so we had to prove that we, we really were who we said we were. That's amazing. Um, I think we talked about this, and remind me if we didn't, but um, so the great editor, uh, the late editor, Jonathan Oppenheim, used to talk about this idea of the ghost story. Did we talk about this ever on the I phone? Can't Anyway, it's like this idea that there's a hidden narrative um, of all of our, you know, very personal and often hectic experiences when making a film. And it's not a literal narrative that finds its way into the film, but it's one that informs some of like the best moments of our filmmaking um, because it is the thing that you are feeling and experiencing and living through that is your personal account. And you, it feeds into this idea of like how you are seeing the world and what actually is happening to you guys on the ground. Can you talk about this idea of the ghost story behind some of these images and what you were thinking about, perhaps even struggling with um, at times yeah. as you're making this? I love that way of framing it, that, that ghost image. Ghost image or ghost, ghost story? The ghost story. Ghost story, yeah, yeah, because there is a whole other layer of experiences and um, stories that are really happening behind the film that you're seeing. And oftentimes we would say, oh, we could actually make a cooking show that's like, or a food show that's parallel to the film because we went to so many amazing provinces throughout China and just had some of the best food ever that um, I don't think I'll ever be able to replicate that food tour. But besides that, um, there was also, um, you know, the actual experience of making the film, I would say, is a lot more funny and loose and less stylized than what you see on stage, actually. And there was a lot more of connections between the types of, between the um, people who were welcoming us into these spaces. And there was a lot of cross-cultural curiosity, I would say. Um, like, we would go out to dinners with um, either the factory owners or the factory PR people. Um, I mean, each, each place was so different, obviously, in terms of the kinds of interactions we had. But I would say the most warmth and like most human connections that I ended up experiencing was actually with the people who were involved with the factories and labor, not like the butler schools or the um, manor schools or the wealthy people seen. It was, it was really the, the most kind of 
human interactions and like long dinners that I would have was with the factories. Um, yeah, I love that idea of the ghost story um, in parallel. I think one thing that was maybe um, harder for me to deal with sometimes is that we, we were making this film, it's very much a film about capitalism, and we come in with our own understanding of you know, all of this production and aspiration might not end well for the individuals, but it certainly doesn't end well for us as a civilization, as a planet. Um, and it's really kind of this dichotomy of like knowing that conceptually, but also seeing all these individuals who clearly think this is going to work out for them. And that felt really visceral when we were filming in the Butler School and talking to all these folks who are great. They were all coming from different walks of life, like someone was in the military, someone was a single mother. Um, one of the people had been a nurse, and she left because it was a really difficult working conditions. And they were hoping that this Butler School was going to be their ticket out, and it was going to help them get there. And they were learning all of these things that seem a little archaic, like where to put the fork and how to do all this stuff, because it was going to help them you know, have a better life. And I was just having such a hard time, because I really I wanted it to be true for them. Like I really wanted it to work out. But I also just know that they could end up um, you know, in a really terrible labor situation, being some rich person's you know, go to or squeezing toothpaste. Yeah, and or just having to serve these folks and not necessarily getting paid enough to even be able to, you know, put their kids through school. Like the things that they wanted it to do for them, I was just worried weren't going to happen. But also didn't want to be the, of course, the one telling them like, this might not do what you think it's going to do. Mm. Uh, there's something that's so striking in your film. It's like that you you capture in a way I've never seen, I think, in any film. It's this, the illusion of mobility, choice, and meritocracy in the labor market, right? That is, it's something we see in our capitalist economy. We see it in most you know, extremist capitalist economies. Did you ever get the sense that the workers were aware like, as of, of sort of you know, their placement within it and how mistreated they were you know, particularly at the lowest rungs of, you know, the manufacturing and service sectors that you were looking at. Because um, it's, you know, it is, it is a hard thing to see your cog in the machine, mm -hmm. uh, you know, admittedly, for most. I mean, it, at, in the places that we were filming in, there was an implicit kind of acceptance of people's places in that system, but also a hope of rising within that system as well, which... For some people, it happens, but for most people, it is unfortunately just a dream, an illusion. And, but there's still that hope of, of rising up. So I would say it was really both. And I think a lot of the moments actually did end up in the film when you see someone not wanting to pay the bribe and not wanting to take their boss out to lunch. And I think we saw so many of those moments. But also just people who are trying to reclaim their time, like watching a movie, um, we, we got to see the film on an IMAX recently, and I noticed in one scene where someone's watching a movie, the scene they're watching is actually about escape, and I could see what the subtitle said, and it was actually, even the, the film that they're watching to escape their job is about some characters trying to escape something else. And so I think people, maybe not explicitly, but implicitly know that this isn't necessarily um, how things should be, and they're trying to find ways where they get their own agency and where they can push back or where they can still um, be in charge of their own time even if they're being paid hourly to stamp something on a knife. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's such a hard thing to have like a cogent and um, very, you know, meaningful conversation about globalization and capitalism, capitalism when we're talking about kind of the, the localized worker. And so there's something about, right, this... Um, the industrialized process that, like, you look at any one moment and it could look so arbitrary. Like, why should I pay attention to this part of, like, plastic bottle manufacturing or, you know, recycling or whatever it may be? And yet, when you create a film like you have, the totality of that experience evokes this unbelievably overwhelming mosaic, right? It's almost like the banality becomes the banality of evil when we're looking at the capitalism. And I, I can only attribute that to this co deep commitment to formalism that you demonstrate in this film. Can you talk about that? I mean, it's so striking, um, you know, your approach and 
Like, how did you think about the structure of this? How did you think about where to pay attention and how to sort of like stay in tune with your intention? Yeah, a, a lot of it for me was really intuitive and based on instinct and kind of following my gut. But as you were talking, I was thinking um, people, when we talk about this movie, even though factories are only like the first third of the movie, people tend to talk about that a lot. And it's interesting because um, I did a lot of labs and residencies with this film. And when I was in the labs and getting feedback, there were a good number of people who would say, the, this stuff, this factory stuff isn't anything new for me. We all know about that. We've all seen it, been there, done that. Like, that's old news. Like, let's see the new stuff that you're talking about, like live streamers and the Butler School stuff. But I think that um, I realized through making this film, it's not about the content as much as the form sometimes, where it's like, yes, we all know that factories and labor exists, but it's just a new way of seeing it. And so I think when shooting and when editing um, and working on the score, the whole, I mean, the whole process of it, it's thinking about making it a cinematic experience and making you feel something. And while I was shooting, one thing that I was thinking about was trying to hold space for two truths at once. That's really what, for me, like the whole vibe of the movie is. There's like this vibe of people um, having hope and economic progress and being lifted out of poverty, upward mobility, coming to the cities and experiencing a new, a new type of freedom. And in many ways, these factory jobs are hopeful for a lot of people. But at the same time, there's the truth of exploitation, income inequality, um, global warming, and um, just all of the, there's just the dark side and the light side happening at the same time. And I think that the score kind of reflects that too, where it's this feeling of mystery and otherworldliness, where we're kind of in awe of these spaces. And there's, it's just holding the dark and light spaces at the same time. So that's a lot of what was going through my mind. Yeah, yeah I mean, there's so much, like it, it, it brings me to like, like Zhao Liang's documentaries like we were talking about earlier, but then also like Zhao Zhangku's films, like this aspirational kind of like upward mobility that's tamped down by the structural, you know, oppression, you know, of capitalism. And I'm curious, like, are you thinking about narrative in like multiple ways? Or do you, do you secretly see yourself as like more of an experimental maker or do you? Yeah, I think, um... There's no, not that there's no difference, but in terms of putting a value judgment, in terms of narrative film or documentary film, I'm like pretty genre agnostic in that sense. So I knew that this documentary, I wanted it to first and foremost be a cinematic experience rather than kind of like a social issue film that was trying to tell you a specific message. It is more, it leaves a lot to the audience to kind of, um, be thrown into these situations and to situate yourself and not necessarily know what we're doing, but I wanted that kind of active audience participation. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, it really shows. I'm curious, did you, did you ever turn the camera off? And if so, when? You mean like because we had to? I, yeah, just were there moments that you did not, you, you could not or did not or chose not to include scenes? Well, I mean, one thing about um, having the co-cinematographer, Nathan Truesdell, who's not here tonight, is that I find that sometimes shooting is similar to writing. I used to um, do creative writing, and I had aspirations to be a writer. And it's similar, I think, in that you sort of write, and when you think you're done writing and you have nothing left in you, that's when all of the good material comes out. And sometimes it's that way with shooting. When you think you've shot everything that you could cover in one space and you've sort of just given up and are exhausted, um, that's when like some of the magic happens. So what was great was Nate and I could trade off the cameras together. So when one of us got tired, we could sort of pick up where the other left off and n not stop shooting. Um, and another thing that made me think of was one of the first early shoots when we were still really fumbling and trying to find our way and find, figure out what this film was about. Initially, it was more um, environmentally driven and it was supposed to be about the cycle of production, consumption, and waste. And I was looking for sites of waste like electronic waste and plastic waste, which for many reasons we can talk about later, it was hard or impossible to find. 
But there was one day where I was just wandering around looking for e-waste, and at the end of the day, I was just so discouraged of not finding it. But I thought, I need to shoot something anyway, because we didn't shoot a single frame that day. So um, we bought this, like, cricket um, off the street, you know, in those little jars, and I spent a few hours filming this cricket eating this peanut, and at one point I was convinced that that was going to end up in the film somehow. Um, but it was too much. It couldn't... No, it would, it would have been too much. But I think just, just sometimes the act of shooting can be like the act of writing or creating anything. You just have to get it out there. And it's like a muscle to exercise. So there's this kind of incredible um, piece of the film that, I, you know, I'm curious if this is intentional, but... Um, this is, you know, along the lines of the illusion of capitalism, right? That individuals can define their own futures, and you kind of you you clearly are keyed into that when you start the film, right? That um, you know, workers who are given this choice of like, do you want a stand up or sit down job in a factory? And then later on, there's other questions that um, individuals are um, kind of given the opportunity to ask, right? Do I want to make ten million or thirty million in three or ten years? And um, I'm, I'm curious about this kind of like performative aspect of capitalism and how much you were thinking about um, this as you were putting together these scenes because, you know, there, there's this feeling sometimes where, I mean, clearly, you know, the people that you've chosen to film with are, are performing the part that they think you are there to cover, and yet you're seeing the totality of this how the system of, of all of this works. And so how, I don't know what my question is, but it's like, how are you sorting through that as you're sequencing and editing? Like, what is, what is the logic that allows you to kind of like create this, this really um, fluid experience around the illusion of this whole yeah. capitalistic dream? That's a great question. Um, Did it make sense? Do you want to start? Yeah, no, yeah. I think I, 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 <laughs> I'm 100% see where you're going with it. I think some, some of the moments are almost a little bit haunting as how specific the instructions are. Like, this is how many teeth when you smile. And I think, I mean, as women being told uh, involuntarily that you have to smile, like, who decided that that's the injunction? Like, who said this is the thing that will help you succeed in the world? But it's a real rule that's there. And so one thing that maybe is more apparent in China than in other parts of the world right now is how transparent people are. Like, these are the rules. You must play by them. If they work, you will succeed. Um, or when the, the head um, teacher at the Butler School says, you know, say whatever you want about your boss behind their back, be nice to them in first. Here, I feel like when you are in a service industry job, someone's like, you know, the customer's always right, or you have to make people feel good. You have to love your job. We're all family. There's no illusions of that there. It's very much like if you do everything right and you act right and you put on the right appearances, you will succeed and then you will get this. And I mean, kind of like what we were saying earlier, neither of those are totally true. But there, at least it's a little bit more clean cut. Um, and I think people are trying to learn very quickly what the new rules of this current setup is. Um, or when people are teaching each other to live stream, you know, that didn't exist two or three years ago. And now they're like, OK, if you want to make money really quickly, go to influencer school, learn to sell the shoes in the right way, make your rhymes work. And I think the thing that's so fascinating and that Jessica shows so well is everyone's trying to figure it out. And as soon as that switches, you know, people are ready to learn the new rules because you need to stay ahead. And I think that try, seeing so many people try to learn the rules all at once makes the kind of invisible systems and exploitative forces of capitalism really real. Yeah, that's a, that's, that was a perfect answer. That's totally what she said. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's like the way that I say it is kind of seeing capitalism in a different context. And in China, it just, the rules are more clear. It's just more laid out. And um, it's seeing it, seeing capitalism, Western style capitalism, but in a nominally communist country, I think you see a lot of its contradictions laid bare, and that makes it really interesting. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's you know, much less, less self-determinism than we're led to believe here and there. I, I'm so, I, I find the poem and sort of the book ending so, such a beautiful frame, and it, it keeps it so 
um, personal in a sense that like it, it's like urging us as the viewer to to think about you as a filmmaker and us as sort of um, you know uh, a guest along your journey, right? Um, can you talk about like how did you arrive at choosing this poem? You know, was it what is the history behind it? You know? Yeah, um, it came at the very end actually. I so going back a few steps, my uh, mother, who is Chinese and has parents from China, uh, would always tell me about my great grandfather, who was this supposedly well-known poet in Hunan, who could read a huge book forwards and then recite it backwards immediately, and was in the book of who's who, which she's kind of prone to exaggeration, so I never fully believed it. Um, but then, fast forward, uh, the last shoot that I'm in China, we go to this city called Changsha in Hunan province, which is where we were shooting in an air conditioning factory, and that's actually where you see the workers in the military gear training, because um, they're it's job training. Um, and I mentioned to my mom that I was going there, and she told me, oh, that's actually where my father's from, where, you're, where our whole family in China's from. And I was shocked, because no one had ever been there that I knew, um, besides my grandfather, but he, he long died. Um, and so I mentioned this to Kira randomly, and she put me in touch with a historian in that city, who then, on a, day's, on a few days' notice, was able to find living relatives because my great-grandfather really was this famous poet in Hunan. And somebody brought, drove hours away from this poet society with this book and brought it to me to show me um, his, his old poetry. And it was, yeah, pretty, very moving experience, very surreal. Then, this was December 2019, right before the pandemic hit. Then I went home, and then it was like, six months or 10 months later, and we were about to submit to our first festival, and we needed a title. And the whole time we were calling it Untitled PRC Project, because we didn't have anything better. Um, and Kira was like, why don't you go back and look at some of those poems? And I was like, I don't think anything will really stick, but I just did it. Um, and one of them was about, in what the way I interpret it, is it, it's about the paradox of progress. The narrator climbs um, a high structure, climbs a tower, and looks down, and instead of climbing the tower and alleviating his worries, um, it increases them because he's able to see all of the chaos below. And the poem is called Ascension, so that's how we got the title of the film, and then that's how I ended up bookmarking the film with the um, first line of the poem and the last line of the poem. That's incredible. Yeah. Well, I'm just curious, just as an Asian American filmmaker, right, you know, how did this, um, how did this shift you or change you, this experience of going Yeah, you know, I think like, um, just feeling like this sense of identity expanding more and feeling like the lines are a bit blurrier between family, being Chinese American and being from China and meeting the, I've stayed in touch with these relatives and actually one of them who's a bit younger than me, um, maybe like five or 10 years younger, she works at Google in Silicon Valley. <laughs> so she came to our San Francisco screening. Oh, wow. um, yeah, and she's the first of the family there to come to the States. So that was pretty crazy. So just sort of this cross-cultural, just identities blurring and it kind of, yeah, it made me just feel like this expansive sense of feeling. It, it's an incredibly ambitious film. I, um, I, and in the most subtle and nuanced of ways as well, I, um, not just for the feat of kind of like capturing, um, you know, this large globalized industrial machine, right? Um, but uh, I, also in this term, the sense of like the, the idea of like what is a decisive moment in filmmaking, right? Like there are these moments where it's a little boy we're getting the notice. Uh, but there's like a little boy in an office um, who is eating a treat. Ice cream cone. An ice cream yeah. cone. Or the young woman in the sex doll factory mm. who is she like a new recruit? She's someone's, I believe, younger sister um, or, or um, relative. And she's there kind of learning. She's training. And yeah, I love that moment where she sort of, and we didn't even capture that. I can't remember if we captured that knowingly or not. That could have been a time where, because sometimes when shooting, I would just let the camera run and 
um, let it record without trying to judge what was happening in front of it. And that might have been one of those moments where afterwards, when looking at the footage, I was like, oh, there's this young woman in the sex doll scene who's not in uniform. She's here being trained. And she's sort of like in her own mind, in her own world, learning about this. And is this going to be her future? We don't know. It's uncertain. And she's sort of touching the foot in this gingerly way. And there's something just so like sweet and heartbreaking and intimate about it all at the same time. But so do you know, because your camera leads us to believe like you absolutely recognize it in the moment because of the attention you give to it. And is it? Sometimes I recognize it. Sometimes I find it later in the mm. editing like find it later scrubbing through footage. And so you're filming a lot, very durationally. Oh, yeah. OK. Yeah. That, that specific so one, I can't remember. I can't remember if that was intentional or not. But we might have actually discovered that later in the editing room, which I think is exciting, actually, when I don't know what it is I'm getting and find it later. Right. Yeah, that's what Al Mazels would say. Half of the directing mm. is in the field, half is in the edit room. Yeah. Um, well, I guess we should take questions yeah. from the audience, right, if we still have time. Does anybody want to step up to the mic? It's so damn bright up here. Someone's coming down. OK. It's very bright up here. Thank you so much. And I can't, uh, to tell you the truth, I can't imagine seeing this on a small screen. Um, and so the cinematic experience was, was very powerful, and the storytelling was very powerful. But there's an, an incredible role that music plays in this. And uh, I was very conscious of it, both its rise and fall, and there was something that almost felt Mongolian in the very beginning. And uh, I wondered if you could talk about how you worked with music mm. and, and how that paralleled with the storytelling. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because the score is one of my favorite parts of the film. I worked with this composer, Dan Deacon, who's also, he's more well known as a musician um, than a composer, but he's been scoring documentaries mostly randomly for the past few years. Um, but we had a really incredible collaboration and the, the score is comprised of partially of a um, like guided improv session that he held with different musicians re recording strings, and then partially um, a library of audio sound recordings that um, Nate and I recorded with the different factor uh, in all the different locations. So we would record the different types of factory machinery, but also um, like the beeping of the bicycle graveyard at the beginning that you hear. We would record those beeps. And um, Dan made a score that the, where the um, natural sound and his sounds speak to one another. And sometimes you don't know what score and what's diegetic sound. And he manipulated the sounds. He transcribed the sounds. He processed them in a way that became very musical for us. Um, and I think like part of what I loved working about him was his ideas with the film. He's someone who really puts himself in other people's shoes. So he's um, where is he, like upstate New York or something, Long Island, um, this like white guy. But he was putting himself in the other people's shoes the whole time and asking himself what it's like to uh, be in all of these different jobs. And oftentimes he would say, like, oh, yeah, this really is just like in the States. Um, a, a lot of the things that he would see in the movie reminded him of being an American, which is what I liked, because I don't want it to be so much about like China as this other sort of place, but rather to see the universal um, themes in there. So I remember once he sent me on Instagram this financial cryptocurrency bro thing where it was like, next year I will have a house, I will have a Ferrari, I will have this thing. And it reminded us so much of the star boss scene. And, um, but just on a technical note, too, and with the score, he also composed it so that, um, and like I didn't know at the time, he told me after, that the score goes up the harmonic scale, so mirroring the theme of ascension. But as it got up, it goes more and more out of harmony. And harmony is also something that we were playing with in the film as well. Yeah, he was so amazing working with the score conceptually, too. Like some of the scenes um, where they're manufacturing 
the plastic widgets, he would use only plastic instruments. And he would try to really match the score to what was going on in the film. But also, something he mentioned to us recently, the fact of working on this film has changed how he sees um, people working in general. So he's back to touring now. But he said at some point when he was playing a show, all he could think about was the people um, running the bar, working the bar during his show, and all the people working the door and whose job was night after night to be there, you know, making sure people had the right bracelets at a concert. And he said he never would have thought about how what for him is work, but for the audience is fun, is also work for other people. Incredible. Yeah, it's such a great score. There's someone else. Hi. Um, could you talk a little bit about the research process and uh, maybe elaborate on how much happens and how long it happens? Because you said it was a really long shoot and it seemed like it happened in stages. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about uh, research, location scouting, and how everything came together. Um, that's a great question. And there's, we shot in 51 locations and I like to say, like, ultimately each location has its own story of how we'd come to it. But a lot of it really was um, just kind of cold researching online and finding um, fixers and field producers in China who might have access to some of these places. Sometimes it was cold reaching out to them. Sometimes it was through a connection. Um, but it a lot of the journalists, a lot of journalists have covered some of these places. So it's not like it was, um, we were the first people to discover anything. It was other, other people had been there reporting on places like this, and it was more the way that we were filming was the thing that was, and putting it together was the thing that was different. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, each place had its own story. Um, some of them would be, you know, Jessica would see an amazing a photojournalist essay. Um, I mean, the bicycle graveyards are something that was just so visual, and we started seeing a lot of those. Um, but other ones would just kind of be an idea. Like, I remember when we were talking about you know, different training. Um, I was kind of offhandedly mentioned that, like, all, you know, universities in China make the students do one day of military training, which is kind of absurd, but, you know, this is how it works, and a lot of factories do that, too. And then I remember just being like, oh, it would be cool if we could film a military training. Um, and then the air conditioning factory um, happens to also host an artist residency, um, where they invite artists to do um, sort of conceptual social practice work with the factory workers. And so when we were looking for that, I was just messaging the people who run the arts residency, being like, hey, I'm working with this great artist and filmmaker who's interested in this. And they were like, oh, perfect. Our training for the factory workers is scheduled on these dates. Can you come by then? So some of these were, were really straightforward. Um, but then some of the other ones, like some of the factories, um, some of the field producers we work with who are also artists and filmmakers in their own right, we'd just be like, you know, where do you think someone is processing plastic waste? And then it would just be calling you know hundreds of places and seeing who would say yes but like um two opposite stories which i think is interesting is the bicycle graveyards the way we found that is we knew that this was a thing that was happening because all of these journalists had been um taking there were all these photo journalists publishing photos of them but they're constantly disappearing because china's trying to hide them but new ones are always popping up and the person who found that for us is actually this guy from upstate New York who moved to Chengdu and is a skateboarder. And because he loves skateboarding, he would just go to the outer edges of the cities. And he's just spent so much time like roaming around. So he had kind of a good sense of the outskirts of the city and had a feeling that one of them was out there. And that's how, that's how he found it. So it was really being able to cast a wide net. And then another one, um, which I was telling you, I think, earlier about the bodyguard school. Um, the bodyguard school, one of our fixers who works for Time magazine, he had already done a piece there. So he had already been there um, covering that. So, yeah. I, I'm so curious, actually, if there's time waiting for the next person to ask a question. I mean, every scene is like brimming with life and drama and information. Like, if you could, if you had to choose or could choose to make one film about one scene, hmm. what would that be? I would, it's hard to say, maybe the bodyguard school or the sex doll factory. Which you did? Or, oh yeah, which, yeah, actually the, we made a, um, Nate and I made a short film about the sex doll factory because, it, and there was actually two or three in that movie and all of the CEOs were women, which I found fascinating. So 
that that short film is more in we interview the the woman who runs it so that was like a very stylistically very different were you torn at times um, by the idea need to kind of like keep moving forward and all the time yeah. I mean the most time we'd spend in one place was like three maybe four days but usually it was about two days and all the time I wanted to stay in one um, one place longer but because of the time and money we had to keep moving around and I knew while I was making it as we kept going that the film was really about the variety and the duration of the different types of places that we would go to to create this tapestry so that they could all fit together into this one movie. I think we're getting the signal. Yeah. Well, Stephen, uh, um, Jessica, and Kira, thank you so much for this insightful conversation. Um, and to Jessica and Kira for sharing such a beautifully rendered film, um, you know, that's going to leave much food for thought for us all. Thank you. So we really feel honored. Thank you also to MTV Documentaries. And um, thank you all for um, joining us this evening. We hope to see you back at Asia Society again soon. Thanks so much. Thank you.